Good morning. And welcome to worship here at Salem Lutheran Church as we celebrate the festival of Pentecost today. My name is Paul Wilde. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's my privilege to lead you in worship this morning. Special welcome to any guests who are here with us this morning, as well as all of Salem's members who are here to worship God in his house. We ask those of you who are in church this morning to please remember to sign the worship register books in the pews. That helps us a great deal, and we appreciate that a lot. Thanks for doing that. We also welcome those of you who are watching from a distance as we live stream this service. We're glad you're able to join in that way. Today is the the holiday of Pentecost. It's the one big festival, the one big holiday of the church year that we give to the Holy Spirit. And I think the Holy Spirit is maybe the most neglected person of our triune God, isn't he? And and I wonder if maybe he's okay with that, happy to point point us to the work of the Father, the work of the Son, and, and call it a good day at that. And yet, as we look at what he's done for us, we recognize that the Holy Spirit can't just be relegated to, to the background. And we don't want to give in to the temptation to ignore him, or as some, some people, even Christians, sometimes do, just turn him not into a, a part of the Trinity, a, a person of the triune God, but, but maybe just a movement or a feeling within us. No, as we look at God's word today, we're going to see that the Holy Spirit is so much more and that even though his, his work is maybe sometimes in the background work that we don't see as blatantly or celebrate as much as the work of the Father and the Son, it is no less amazing, no less important for us. So as we look at God's word today, we're going to see the victories the Holy Spirit wins for each and every one of us and God willing, we'll be encouraged by that. God bless us as we do that. We'll begin our worship this morning by singing our opening hymn, hymn 477, O Day Full of Grace.
Please stand. For worship this morning, we follow the service setting one that can be found beginning on page 154 in the hymnal. It's also projected in its entirety on the screens. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our own hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all our sins. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to live, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross, and, re- and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, God and Lord, come to us this joyful day with your sevenfold gift of grace. Rekindle in our hearts the holy fire of your love, that in a true and living faith we may tell abroad the glory of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Father, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading for the celebration of Pentecost goes all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, the book of Genesis. Here we see God's loving discipline where he sees the people who are united in their language and united in their desire to 
well, not glorify him, but make a name for themselves. God in his love and his wisdom decides that now's the time to, to confuse their languages, make differences in language, and, and uh, he uses that to keep them from committing the sin of building a tower to their own glory and, and doing things that lead them away from him. Of course, we see this, this curse of Babel where they, they have all the different languages completely undone and it doesn't stop the Holy Spirit from sharing his word to all different nations, all different peoples. We see that true today and certainly see the, the beginning of that at, at the first Pentecost. We read Genesis chapter 11 beginning with verse 1. Now in the whole world, now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. The word of the Lord We continue our worship by singing the psalm of the day, Psalm 104. We'll sing this psalm in unison. The second reading for Pentecost is the account of Pentecost from the book of Acts. Here we see the Holy Spirit's power and display, not just in the miraculous signs, the the sound of rushing wind, the tongues of fire, and the the languages that the disciples suddenly were able to speak, but we also see his, his power at work gloriously in his word as he works through Peter as Peter preaches the good news of salvation. We read Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. 
Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the great coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel. The Holy Gospel for Pentecost comes from the book of John, chapter 14. These words serve as the basis for our sermon as well as the theme for our worship. We read the gospel of John, chapter 14, beginning with verse 23. Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own, they belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The Gospel of the Lord. You You may be seated. We'll continue by singing the hymn of the day, hymn 585, Come Holy Ghost, God and Lord.
I think it might feel a little bit strange for us to celebrate a holiday like Pentecost in 2022. After all, we remember the amazing victories for the church that God the Holy Spirit won on that first Pentecost. Preach, Peter preaching to this diverse crowd of people from all over who had gathered in Jerusalem. The people being amazed by the, the miraculous signs that the Holy Spirit gave. The sound of the rushing wind, the tongues of fire, and then of course every, all the disciples speaking in all of these diverse languages to the people so that they can hear the wonders of God in their own home language. The crowd actually listening to the preaching of God's word. And not just listening, but being cut to the heart as they are called out on their sins. And then finally, trusting in the forgiveness that Peter announces is theirs in Jesus and receiving that forgiveness in a wonderful way in the, in the sacrament of baptism. It must have been wonderful and empowering and encouraging for the disciples as they saw Jesus promise that the Holy Spirit would come and equip and strengthen them and work through them coming true in miraculous and amazing ways. We can understand why they think it's something worth celebrating, but at the same time, it seems like that's a pretty far cry from most of our experiences as Christians, isn't it? I mean, when's the last time you tried to share your faith with someone and they didn't just shoot back something like, well, that's your opinion, or that's what you believe, but how can you know you're sure? Some other rationalization or excuse or objection. Instead of the church growing by 3,000 souls in a day, which we can hardly even imagine, or 3,000 souls in a year, which we can still hardly imagine, or 3,000 souls in a, in a decade, the church instead shrinks year after year after year. We've seen that pretty clearly and painfully at Salem, haven't we? But the problem isn't just ours. It doesn't belong to just our congregation around our synod. It's, it's the same story. In fact, some estimates from the synod office, as they look at some of the tre trends in, in demographics and, and the declines of our congregations and the trajectory of our membership, estimate that our membership as a church body, not just as a congregation, would hit zero, actually zero members, and in kind of a shockingly short amount of time. But it's not just a Wells problem either, is it? Christianity at a, as a whole seems to be struggling. I was just reading an article this week that talked about other denominations that would be jealous of how slowly our synod is shrinking. There's some denominations that are on track to even maybe in this decade have more pastors than they have members in total. Christianity seems to be suffering and the unbelieving world rejoices, glad to do away with a faith that they see as unimportant or irrelevant, unhelpful, maybe even harmful, and certainly outdated. So it's easy for us to feel less like celebrating a day like Pentecost and more like wringing our hands and wondering, what do we do? Throwing our hands up in, in despair, saying, how do we turn this around? Why are so many people so evil and stubborn in their refusal to hear God's word? What can we do? What do we need to do? Why isn't the Holy Spirit working the same way anymore? In fact, I think it's a question kind of like this that one of the disciples asked Jesus that prompted him to speak the words of our gospel that we're looking at this morning. But before we get to that big picture, Jesus' words really, really stop any self-righteous hand-wringing we might be tempted to do right in their tracks. Anyone who loves me will obey my commandments, Jesus says. If you think about it, that, that simple statement almost makes your heart skip a beat, doesn't it? It's really a conditional. If you love me, you will do this. You will obey my commandments. And Jesus even goes so far as to say the negative. If you don't love me, if a person doesn't love me, they won't obey my teaching. So maybe the first question we have to ask ourselves before we start worrying about the, the world and Christianity as a whole is, do you love Jesus? I mean, do you really, are you really the Christian that you, you identify as? Are you really justified in worrying about everyone else in the world and what they're doing and why they don't accept the gospel like you do? Why they don't come to church or live the way the Bible tells us we should? Do you love Jesus? Do you show that by really obeying Jesus' teachings? Jesus' teachings are pretty clear. He sums them up for us really, really, really beautifully in the Ten Commandments. Do you love God above everything else, truly? Or are there other things that you value or trust in more than him? 
Do you actually use God's name to pray regularly? Or do you neglect his name and instead maybe even sometimes misuse his name? Do you really love God's teaching and his word? Do you really gladly hear and learn his word every opportunity you get? Or is your devotional life something that happens really when you have time for it and it's convenient? Is your worship life something that only happens when you have time for it and it's convenient? Or are you a are you a person who's eager to be in church every Sunday and every opportunity you have for special worship, worship services and opportunities? Or are you the person who comes because, well, it's habit or grudgingly because it's what you have to do? Are you a person who is grateful for the, the, the good blessings of being able to watch on, on YouTube or, or, or listen on the radio, but, but not just grateful for that when you need to be away from church because of this, that, or the other thing, but Use those as excuses not to be in church with your fellow believers when you otherwise could be. Are you a person who really would rather be home on a Sunday morning when there are so many Christians who are stuck at home or bedridden who would give anything to just be in God's house with God's people one last time before God calls them home? Do you obey your, the authorities and, and your parents and not just obey them grudgingly but serve them gladly and pray for their benefit and honor and love and respect them? Do you, do you not just avoid harming others but always look out for the good of others? Is your life completely pure, not just in your, in your actions but in your thoughts and your words and your search history? Do you avoid not just blatant robbery but any time you might somehow weasel a little extra out of someone? Do you always speak well of everyone? Or do you sometimes give in to gossip? Are you always content with what the blessings that God has given you and you never ever begrudge anyone the blessings that he's given them and not to you? Do you love Jesus? The answer shows in your actions. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. Do you love him or... Do you just love him when it feels right or it's easy? Do you love him or do you love him only on your own terms? Or do you just want to love him, but not if it means doing this or avoiding that? You guys, I know where I fall and it does not give me any wiggle room to judge others or worry about what anyone else is doing with their life, much less wish people would be like me. And Are you kidding me? Jesus, with these few little words, cuts us right to the hearts and shows that maybe we don't love Jesus as much as we think we do. Maybe we're not the good Christians. We're so tempted to think we are. Maybe we don't love him as much as we think we do. We have this problem in our own hearts that we need to deal with before we can even start worrying about the big picture, like what's going on with the world or what's going on with Christianity. We've got the problem of our own lack of love for our Savior. And this is not a problem that we can deal with on our own. Of course, we know this theologically speaking because the Bible is abundantly clear that we cannot save ourselves by our own works. But we know it experientially too, don't we? Because we've all tried and we keep going back to trying to do this on our own. I mean, how often have you found yourself trying to do something extra good because your conscience was bothering you about that other thing that you did? Or how often have you looked back with that 2020 hindsight and kind of laughed at yourself because, man, you were clinging to that one good thing you did that day and, and, and putting all your confidence and saying, this is why I know I'm a good person. I put that shopping cart away that was in the middle of the, middle of the parking lot and I didn't even put that shopping cart there, but I put it away. I'm a good person for that. How ridiculous that is in hindsight. Like the crowd at Pentecost, God's law when Jesus puts it this simply, this clearly, it cuts us to the heart, leaving us wondering what to do and broken. But wondering what to do is exactly the wrong thing, isn't it? It's easy for us to turn even our desire to, to show our love for Jesus, our desire to obey his teachings into something that we do, something that we earn for him. I mean, even our own worship lives, we, we can easily turn that into something that makes us feel good about ourselves, feel, makes us feel like, well, I've been doing the right thing and I wish more people would do this like me. After all, I'm the person who's here in church on a Sunday morning while everyone else is either at home or at Kerwood or wherever, sleeping on vacation, whatever, and they're not here and I am. 
even the good things that we want to do for our Savior, we can turn into this temptation to do and earn. But if our obedience to Jesus' teachings is what makes us saved, Jesus would have said so. He would have said something like, anyone who is worthy of me obeys my teaching. Anyone who deserves my love obeys my teaching. Anyone who is saved obeys my teaching. But he said, anyone who loves me obeys my teaching. And it's subtle, but it's a big difference. Because you work for your boss or your teacher because you have to earn that paycheck or earn that grade. And you obey the government because you want to avoid the the fines or the jail time that comes with not obeying the government the way they want you to. We get that. But why do you sometimes get your child their favorite treat? Why do you sometimes stop and get flowers for your spouse? Why do you sometimes make the favorite meal for your loved one? Not because you owe them anything, not because you're trying to pay back anything. You do it because you love them. And your relationship with Jesus isn't like your relationship with a teacher or employer. It's more like your relationship with that family member or spouse whom you deeply love. A relationship with him is based on love. And this all sounds good, something that we aspire to, right? It's a, it's a relationship that we would, of course, want, but it's a battle every single day. Because so often we don't show our love for him. So often we turn even our, the little ways we do show our love for him into us doing it for him to earn his love when that's not how this relationship works. In fact, this relationship isn't something that we could even want or get on our own. As, after all, as we say in the explanation to the third article of our creed, we can't, by our own thinking or choosing, believe in Jesus or come to him. And that would be terrible except for the work of the Holy Spirit. Because this is where the Holy Spirit comes with his first victory for each one of us. He wins victory for us by creating faith in our hearts. And he does this miraculously, but not magically. He has tools. He uses Jesus' own teaching, his word, that Jesus himself says isn't just his own, but comes from God the Father himself. It's through this word that the Holy Spirit reaches out to us and creates faith. This word that tells us that even though we can't ever earn it, we have God's love. This word that comforts us by telling us that our sins are forgiven no matter how impossible it will ever be for us to pay them back. The word that tells us exactly how much our God and Savior were willing to suffer in order to win us this salvation. It's a, it's a message that inspires us to love our Savior and in love, out of thankfulness, live for him. It's the message that tells us that as we do that, even though we can't come to God on our own, we don't have to because God himself God the Father and God the Son, through the faith the Holy Spirit works, create their, create their home, create their dwelling in our own hearts. And because of that, we get to live in true and lasting, eternal peace. Like Jesus says, he's giving peace, and it's not peace like the world can give. It's not a peace that, that depends on us getting along with him. It's not a peace that depends on us earning it or deserving it. It's not a peace that depends on any sort of contingency. It's not based on anything other than his promise. And since it's a peace that the world can't give, it's also a peace that the world can't ever take away, no matter how grim or bleak or dark the perspective might look. And friends, this is the victory of the Holy Spirit and no one else. The Holy Spirit alone, the one that makes Jesus' death count for you personally. And this alone is reason for us to celebrate, to give the Holy Spirit a day uh, each uh, one Sunday a year to celebrate the fact that he's the one who connects you to Jesus. He's the one who, who gives you this confidence that you know that Jesus' work was for you. That alone is enough, but wait, there's more, as there often is in God's word, and especially with God's grace, grace upon grace. The first two words of the gospel for today, we read, Jesus replied, So if you were annoyed that we don't know the question that led to it and feel like we just picked up in the middle of a conversation, be annoyed no longer, because here it is. And as we we see this question, it's going to help us understand maybe more deeply Jesus' answer, maybe more deeply the victories that the Spirit wins for us. 
The disciple Judas, not Judas Iscariot, the other one who goes by the name Thaddeus as well, had just asked Jesus this question. He said, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? This question came on Monday, Thursday, as Jesus and his disciples were in that upper room. And Jesus was instructing his disciples. He talked about how he was going to leave them and go to heaven, to his father's house to prepare rooms for them. He talked about how he was the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to the father. And he talked about how they would see him and see the Father through him, but the world would reject him. And Judas, Thaddeus, must have felt like this is really weird because Jesus is the promised Savior of all people, but he's not going to show himself to all people, the entire world? After all, the Savior of the world should be seen by the entire world, you'd think, and in power too, you'd think. Maybe Judas was like the other disciples were often, still a little bit confused about the kind of kingdom that the Messiah was going to bring. So Jesus answers him. Jesus replies, and it's essentially this, Judas, my kingdom isn't exactly what you're thinking it is. It's all the people who love me because of what I've done for them and obey my teachings because they love for me. Because they love me. It's me and my heavenly Father living in their hearts. My kingdom is in the hearts of believers who have, wor- who have had faith worked in their hearts by the Holy Spirit. And my kingdom doesn't come with the kind of strength that you, Judas, or the other disciples might expect. God's kingdom doesn't. It doesn't even really come with the amazing displays of God's power that we see on that first Pentecost, the the rushing wind sound or the, the tongues of fire and the different languages that suddenly the disciples were able to speak without ever studying. Those are pretty cool, but the most amazing miracle on that day of Pentecost, the greatest show of power by the Holy Spirit, it wasn't those things. It was the Holy Spirit taking the word of God proclaimed by Peter and using it to create faith in the hearts of 3,000 more people. And maybe we look for the wrong kind of kingdom still today, I wonder. When we're getting all bent out of shape about worrying about the state of our congregation or our synod or Christianity as a whole or even bigger, just the world at large, or when we're trying this, that, and everything else in our power to try to create the kind of kingdom for God that we have in mind being a glorious and powerful and majestic kingdom, creating a glorious and powerful church by God's standard or by our own standards of success, maybe we're, maybe we're just missing the point like Judas was. Maybe we're missing out on seeing the amazing things that the Holy Spirit is doing among us. Because the Holy Spirit truly is continuing to win victory after victory after victory with his tool, the means of grace, the gospel, the good news of Jesus in word and sacrament. Every time you're in a dark place in your life and a passage of scripture brings you comfort, this is not just a happy coincidence. This is not just a mental health event. That's God himself, God the Holy Spirit at work through his powerful tool, encouraging you and equipping you just like Jesus promised he would. Every time you understand a little bit more about your own heart, your own nature, your own situation, your, your status before God, and, and maybe even bigger that you understand a little bit more about the, why the world is the way it is and God's plan for the world, this is the Holy Spirit at work actively enlightening, enlightening you to deeper knowledge and understanding just like Jesus promised he would. Every single aha moment in Scripture, every single ah moment you get from God's Word, this is not just some mental exercise. This isn't just a, 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 a theoretical thing. This is God the Holy Spirit at work. Maybe instead of lamenting the fact that God's church doesn't always look particularly glorious or successful by our standards. We can find lasting peace and comfort in knowing that God's power looks different. It's not a budget. It's not social influence. It's not size or growth. It's the presence of his word that's so powerful. His word that looks so small and and insignificant to the world that rejects it. And sometimes to us in our weakness, God's word even looks small and insignificant. And yet it remains the powerful, glorious tool of the Holy Spirit's victory. 
So whether you're tempted to feel down about the way the world is today and, and worry about all the people who are rejecting God's word and, and worry about all the evil and worry about all of these things, or if you're living under a heavy burden of guilt, Jesus says, do not let your heart be troubled because you don't have to earn God's love. You don't have to believe hard enough or go to church often enough. Of course, you want to do those things because they expose you to God's gospel. But do them because he's already won you over and created his, his home within your heart, not because you're trying to earn your way to him. We don't have to create a congregation that lives up to the glorious, the glorious reputation and, and, and success that it experienced decades ago. We don't have to create a congregation that matches the world's definition of success and power and strength. We don't have to fight the sinful world ourselves. The Holy Spirit does that for us. We simply get to rejoice in the fact that the Holy Spirit won people like you and me, people from all different backgrounds, people who don't speak the same languages as every other believer in the world. We get to rejoice in the fact that the Holy Spirit took people like you and me and brought us together around the gospel. Then we get to keep sharing that gospel so that even more people can hear and love Jesus like we do because of the victory of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. We'll continue by confessing our Christian faith, the faith that the Holy Spirit works in our hearts using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate with the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We continue our worship with a prayer of the church. Today in our special prayers, we remember Ruth, the family and friends of Ruth Hoshield, who God called to her heavenly home yesterday. We also remember all of the members of Salem who are graduating from different levels of education from grade school all the way through college. Let us pray. Blessed and gracious Holy Spirit, Lord and giver of life, you proceed from the Father and the Son, and together with the Father and the Son we worship and glorify you. On this holy day, so soon after our Lord ascended to his throne in glory, you descended among his joyous followers with your holy wind and igniting fire. You opened their eyes to see the clarity and completeness of the good news, just as Jesus promised you would. You ratified their ministry in the sight of the nations and conferred on them gifts and courage to be witnesses to the ends of the earth as Jesus called them to be. Pour out your power on us again, dear spirit, and ignite our minds and hearts to find our purpose in proclaiming the message of Christ. When success seems scarce, console us with the gentle, quiet whisper of your word. When some will listen, open our lips to speak the truth in love. When enemies attack, defend us not with the edge of a sword, but with the power of the gospel. What we pray for ourselves, we pray for your whole church, and especially for those who go out in our stead to many places around the world. 
Guide us deeper every day into the mysteries of Christ and enlarge our grasp of his will and ways. Provide insights to those who teach your word to others that they may expound your truth carefully and precisely. Bless our schools as they prepare men and women to preach, teach, and model your love. Breathe into the hearts of those enduring serious afflictions, stubborn pain, and wrenching doubt, and renew them with your power. Instill your sweet comfort in those who grieve and mourn. Heavenly Father, comfort the family of Ruth Hoshield, whom you have now called to eternal glory in heaven. We praise you for making her your child in baptism and sustaining her faith through the good news about Jesus our Savior. We thank you for the blessings you brought to your church, this community, and his family through her life of Christian service. May the peace and promise of your son's atoning sacrifice on the cross and his empty tomb bring assurance to the hearts of all who mourn. Help us always to live in joyful anticipation of the day when you will call us from our graves, reunite us with Ruth and all believers, and fill us with perfect bliss in your presence forever. O Holy Spirit, sent by Jesus to guide us into all truth, shower your gifts and graces on all graduates. Enable them to use the lessons they have learned to advance their own welfare, serve others, and become ambassadors for Christ. As they step into an uncertain future, strengthen them with your word and sacrament so that they may be comforted with your saving presence. Remind them daily of their baptisms so that they never forget they have received an inheritance that will never fade. According to your design, grant to us another Pentecostal harvest that multitudes from every nation, tribe, people, and language may join the assembly of the church to worship you and give you glory. Come, Holy Spirit, renew the hearts of your faithful people and kindle in us the fire of your love. Amen. We continue our worship by singing the next hymn, hymn 566, Father, God of grace, you knew us.
please stand. We continue with the sacrament of Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who by his willing sacrifice on the cross took away the sins of the world and by his glorious resurrection restored everlasting life. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. We give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we glorify and honor you, O God our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. Again, good morning and welcome. It's a privilege and blessing as always to be together in God's house and worship together and, and be encouraged by the Holy Spirit and receive his blessings. 
I really only have three announcements for you today, only one of which is, is old enough to have made the bulletin. So we'll start with that one. First off, you'll notice that there's an announcement in the bulletin that we're going to have a door offering next, this coming Thursday and Sunday, so this next week of worship. This will be received after the services for Michael Forrester. He's a member here at Salem, and he's going on into study. He's going to study to be a pastor in our synod. So one of the things we can do to show our support for him is participate by by taking this door offering. The uh, the college actually will match our our offering as as part of a tuition assistance package for him. So if you'd like to support him in that way, or even if you just want to support him with your prayers, both are both are more than welcome, and both are powerful and wonderful ways to show your love for him and God's kingdom as he can considers being a pastor. The other two announcements didn't make the bulletin. First, you'll notice on the back table there are some, some uh, brightly co- colored flyers for this year's summer adventure camp that's going to run from July 20th to 22nd. It's for kids ages 5 to 12. If you're 13 and up, I'd be more than happy to help have you as a helper. So if you'd like to help out if you're a chaperone or a junior assistant chaperone or help out even with just some of the planning or other kind of logistical issues, uh, please do talk to me after church or, or get in touch with me sometime this week and, and we'll find a way that you can work. I think if you talk to anyone who helped out last year, you'll, you'll hear that it was quite fun and enjoyable, even if it was maybe a, maybe a mountain of work. Um, and then uh, please do help yourself to some flyers. If you know someone in your, in your family or in your life who has, has kids in that age, please share it with them. There's information and a, and a link for them to go for registration. Registration isn't quite open yet. It'll open on this Friday. Uh, but please do grab a few of those flyers and share them. Uh, thanks to those of you who helped this weekend with the Kerwood and, and, and shared them at, at the Children's Parade as well. And then finally, uh, the one last announcement that did, is newer than the bulletin, we will have our next call meeting the, to call the next pastor here at Salem uh, next week on Sunday, so the Sunday, June 12th, after the late service, so right about now, 1130-ish. Uh, so uh, please do plan on attending that as we, as we pray that God blesses us with another pastor here at Salem. That's all I've got for you, so God bless you with strength and health and safety as you serve him and his kingdom, and God bring us back together to worship him in his house again soon. We'll close our worship today by singing our final hymn, hymn 931, Savior, again to thy dear name we raise. (laughs) 